With winter fast approaching here in Canada, one very helpful fact I learned from Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything came from a section that was talking about human DNA and genes and all that fun stuff. And it says, even thinking, it turns out, affects the way genes work. How fast a man's beard grows, for instance, is partly a function of how much he thinks about sex, because thinking about sex produces a testosterone surge. And here I thought there was only one body part that grew when I thought about sex. But there you go, that'll be helpful for the upcoming cold weather. Here's one scientist who must have had a very long beard. He was a botanist slash zoologist named Carl Linne, also known as Linnaeus. And the book says Linnaeus's other striking quality was an abiding, at times one might say a feverish, preoccupation with sex. He was particularly struck by the similarity between certain bivalves and the female pudenda. To the parts of one species of clam, he gave the names vulva, labia, pubes, anus, and hymen. The book goes on to dive into more detail about this guy, and this all came much to the consternation of others in his field. It says, at all events, it had long been felt that the natural sciences would be appreciably dignified by a dose of classical renaming, so there was a certain dismay in discovering that the self-appointed prince of botany had sprinkled his texts with such designations as clitoria, fornicata, and vulva. Yes, this Linnaeus character was quite an interesting fellow. The book also says, Rarely has a man been more comfortable with his own greatness. He spent much of his leisure time penning long and flattering portraits of himself, declaring that there had never been a greater botanist or zoologist, and that his system of classification was the greatest achievement in the realm of science. Modestly, he suggested that his gravestone should bear the inscription Princeps Botanicorum, or Prince of Botanists. I'm going to get to a bunch of the other fascinating stuff that I discovered by reading this book. This book was actually chosen for me to read by one of my longest standing Patreon supporters. Quite some time back now, I held a poll uh, with my Patreon supporters to determine a few books that I should read, and this book was chosen by that particular Patreon supporter. Speaking of whom, I just want to send out a huge thank you to my supporters, especially to my higher tier supporters, Charles M, Abe O, Saver Girl, Mo Mojo Dam, Joanna N, and to my highest tier supporter, Osmondus Perfect. At this time of year, more than ever, I am grateful to have your support. But without any further distraction, let's dive into this fascinating book. One concern I had about reading this particular book was that it was published in 2003, 20 years ago, if you can believe it. And as you can imagine, the past 20 years have seen so many great advances in science that I was worried that a lot of information in here would be outdated. For example, when this book was published, the Large Hadron Collider hadn't been completed yet, and the existence of the Higgs boson hadn't yet been confirmed, so there were obviously a lot of advances to be made in the years since the publication of this book. And the book itself stresses just how much amazing scientific discovery has been made in, within my lifetime even. I mean, things like a lot of our knowledge about dinosaurs, about the asteroid extinction of the dinosaurs, about tectonic plate movements, early humans, a lot of that stuff has just been very recently in history that we've come to a lot of that knowledge. and. The book itself says, as late as 1988, more than half of all American paleontologists contacted in a survey continued to believe that the extinction of the dinosaurs was in no way related to an asteroid or com cometary impact. As late as 1988, I was 12 years old when the paleontologists still kind of had that old way of thinking about things. But despite these concerns, uh, I did find a lot of great stuff in this book, and partly because, as the title suggests, it is, in part, a history book. It's a short history of nearly everything. So it is both history and a science book, and in fact, a lot of the book has to do with literally all the scientific discoveries have been made since humans have been doing science, and everything we've learned about our world and the universe at large, obviously all condensed into a very brief summary. 
as a result, not a ton of time is spent on the most recent discoveries. A lot of it has to do with the history of science, and a lot of time is spent on the people, the scientists that made these discoveries, and I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about that. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first talk a lot about the scientists and the many, many hurdles and, and obstructions they faced in their scientific work, and then I'm going to jump into a bunch of other fun facts that I learned from reading this book. Before I do that, though, I'll comment quickly on the right now, one of my very favorite people on YouTube is a fellow named Brian, and he has a booktube channel called Bookish, and he has commented in the past in some of his videos that when it comes to nonfiction writing, the prose doesn't really matter because it's really kind of a journalistic style of writing where you are presenting facts, this is what happened, and then this happened. And so in a sense, I guess a lot of nonfiction writing can be excused for being kind of dry, not not dry in a bad sense per se, because you are obviously learning a lot of interesting information, but just in the way that the information is presented is often just very kind of straightforward and clear. Now, I tend to disagree with that. I've read nonfiction books that had great writing, and this is one example. Now, first of all, the author, Bill Bryson, says right in the introduction here uh, regarding his goal of the way the book was written. He starts off by talking about how he spent years reading various books and journals and interviewing experts in various fields. And then he says, the idea was to see if it isn't possible to understand and appreciate, marvel at, enjoy even, the wonder and accomplishments of science at a level that isn't too technical or demanding, but isn't entirely superficial either. And I think that Bill Bryson's really succeeded in that particular aim. Now, I said that I enjoyed his writing, and here's just a really quick example of the way the writing helped with the enjoyment of the book. At one point, the author wishes to convey the idea that a scientist named Albert Michelson had a nervous breakdown and had to take a break from his work for a while, but instead of saying it in that kind of dry, factual manner, here's how he worded it. The work was delicate and exhausting and had to be suspended for a time to permit Michelson a brief but comprehensive nervous breakdown. And, the, and there's this kind of slightly humorous, light tone to the way that's stated that pervades the prose of the book, but doesn't take away from all the wondrous and amazing things that are being presented here. And here are a couple of other examples of where I found myself chuckling a little bit. More to do with the stories that were being told, I guess, than the way they were told, but I mean, that helped a lot too. Here the author is talking about a scientist by the name of Henry Cavendish, and this is a fellow that I can relate to all too well, as you will see as I describe him here. He suffered, in the words of one of his few biographers, from shyness to a degree bordering on disease. Any human contact was for him a source of the deepest discomfort. Once he opened his door to find an Austrian admirer, freshly arrived from Vienna, on the front step. Excitedly, the Austrian began to babble out praise. For a few moments, Cavendish received the compliments as if they were blows from a blunt object, and then, unable to take any more, fled down the path and out the gate, leaving the front door wide open. It was some hours before he could be coaxed back to the property. Even his housekeeper communicated with him by letter. And there are no shortage of quirky and eccentric characters in the field of science. Unfortunately, this quirkiness would border on uh, creepy or downright harmful, as this particular guy named Robert Broom demonstrates. It was Broom's habit, for instance, to do his field work naked when the weather was warm, which was often. He was also known for conducting dubious anatomical experiments on his poorer and more tractable patients. When the patients died, which was also often, he would sometimes bury their bodies in his back garden to dig up for later study. So yeah, in a nutshell, I enjoyed not just the contents of this book, but the way in which it was written. Now, one thing that really struck me while reading it was the fact that almost all of our current scientific knowledge has come from just the tiniest pool of people. The majority of notable scientists were wealthy, white, males, with academic connections who were respected in their fields and didn't challenge the status quo too much or step outside the lanes of their own disciplines. And I'm going to briefly look at each of those characteristics that I just mentioned, starting with the thing that jumped out to me most, which is the fact that so many of these guys were wealthy. And the fact that they were wealthy 
is what allowed them to pursue science to not have to work and spend their time toiling in a field, but they could put their mind and their energies into exploring the world and discovering science. And so here's a quick list and how they were described individually in the book, starting with Charles Lyell. As was generally the pattern with 19th century gentlemen scientists, Lyell came from a background of comfortable wealth and intellectual vigor. Henry Cavendish. Born into a life of sumptuous privilege, his grandfathers were dukes, respectively, of Devonshire and Kent. He goes on to, to describe him further. Frank Bursley Taylor. Taylor came from a wealthy family and had both the means and the freedom from academic constraints to pursue unconventional lines of inquiry. Charles William Beebe. Born in 1877 into a well-to-do family in New York City. Otis Barton. Soon afterwards, he teamed up with Barton, talking about Beeb still, who came from an even wealthier family, had also attended Columbia and also longed for adventure. John Scott Haldane and his son J.B.S. Haldane. The senior Haldane was born in 1860 to an aristocratic Scottish family. His brother was Viscount Haldane, and it goes on to describe him further. So not only were these scientists wealthy people, but they wanted to keep it that way. They didn't want to have anything to do with people who are not wealthy, as is described in this passage. In the winter of 1807, 13 like-minded souls in London got together at the Freemasons Tavern at Longacre in Covent Garden to form a dining club to be called the Geological Society. The idea was to meet once a month to swap geological notions over a glass or two of Madeira and a convivial dinner. The price of the meal was set at a deliberately hefty 15 shillings to discourage those whose qualifications were merely cerebral. So yeah, this geological society was intentionally pricing out those who were merely smart and not also wealthy. So while of course modern scientists <laughs> wish they had a lot of wealth, I mean so much of science now is about fighting for grants to actually learn stuff and to perform the experiments they need to perform, for much of scientific history it was done by wealthy people. I mentioned the idea too that for much of history they were mostly white. And not just white of skin, but also ideologically white, I would say. For instance, we read this in the book. Here we're talking about the field of research into early humans, and we have one scientist who made the discovery that it appears that humanity arose out of Africa. And the book says, Above all, his conclusions flew in the face of accepted wisdom. Humans and apes, it was agreed, had split apart at least 15 million years ago in Asia. If humans had arisen in Africa, why, that would make us negroid for goodness sake. So the scientific community were outraged that our common ancestors had come out of Africa. And it's really hard to know where to be, even begin with breaking down all the issues re related to racism, but from a very scientific perspective, here are a few interesting facts that those with racist ideologies would be good to learn, I think. The first thing is, it mentioned apes, the fact that in terms of the human DNA in comparison to a chimpanzee DNA, we are 98.4% genetically indistinguishable from the modern chimpanzee. So yeah, we're all basically just slightly more advanced chimpanzees to begin with. And it, it becomes even closer when we look at one human to the next. And there's really only a 0.1% difference between your genes and mine. That's really the only genetic difference between one human and the next. I mean, all life on the planet arose from one common ancestor. And so, the book says, indeed, if you look around you on a bus or in a park or cafe or any crowded place, most of the people you see are very probably relatives. When someone boasts to you that he is descended from Shakespeare or William the Conqueror, you should answer at once, me too. In the most literal and fundamental sense, we are all family. So there you go. Take that, racists. Now, the next fact is, of course, that up until very recently, they were all males. And I guess even today, it still can be hard for a woman to break into certain areas of science. In the early days, women were assigned the most menial tasks. And in fact, they were called computers, which is obviously what we ultimately named our computing machines. 
Computers spent their lives studying photographic plates of stars and making computations, hence the name. It was little more than drudgery by another name, but it was as close as women could get to real astronomy at Harvard, or indeed pretty much anywhere in those days. Despite that, we have a couple of examples of women who, despite their limited access to information, made some amazing discoveries. One Harvard computer, Annie Jump Cannon, Annie Jump Cannon, what a name, used her repetitive acquaintance with the stars to devise a system of stellar classifications so practical that it is still in use today. Another woman named Levitt's contribution was even more profound. She noticed that a type of star known as a Cepheid variable, after the constellation Cepheus, where the first was identified, pulsated with a regular rhythm, a kind of stellar heartbeat. Cepheids are quite rare, but at least one of them is well known to most of us. Polaris, the pole star is a Cepheid. And the book mentions that this type of work ensured that women ended up with an appreciation of the fine structure of the cosmos that often eluded their male counterparts. I had also mentioned that it was important that these white wealthy men had academic connections in order to be able to publish their papers and be accepted by the academic community at large. And in the study of tectonic plates, we have this Canadian geologist and it says, in 1963, using magnetic studies of the Atlantic Ocean floor, they demonstrated conclusively that the sea floors were spreading in precisely the manner Hess had suggested and that the continents were in motion too. An unlucky Canadian geologist named Named Lawrence Morley came up with the same conclusion at the same time, but couldn't find anyone to publish his paper. In what has become a famous snub, the editor of the Journal of Geophysical Research told him, such speculations make interesting talk at cocktail parties, but it is not the sort of thing that ought to be published under serious scientific aegis. One geologist later described it as probably the most significant paper in the earth sciences ever to be denied publication. Here's another scientist who was rejected by academia, and this scientist was putting forward the idea that certain things we could observe had to do with glacier movement. However, we have a couple of other scientists who were less than satisfied with this idea, one of whom said, could scratches and polish just be due to ice? Asked Roderick Murchison in a mocking tone at one meeting, evidently imagining the rocks as covered any kind of light and glassy rhyme. To his dying day, he expressed the frank, frankest incredulity at those ice-mad geologists who believed that glaciers could account for so much. William Hopkins, a Cambridge professor and leading member of the Geological Society, endorsed this view, arguing that the notion that ice could transport boulders presented such obvious mechanical absurdity as to make it unworthy of the society's attention. And finally, in the 1860s, journals and other learned publications in Britain began to receive papers on hydrostatics, electricity, and other scientific subjects from a James Kroll of Anderson's University in Glasgow. One of the papers on how variations in the Earth's orbit might have precipitated ice ages was published in the Philosophical Magazine in 1864 and was recognized at once as a work of the highest standard. So there was some surprise and perhaps just a touch of embarrassment when it turned out that Kroll was not an academic at the university but a janitor. <laughs> There's another scientist who had a lot of trouble breaking into the academic world because of his complete lack of credentials. A certain fellow by the name of Albert Einstein, you may have heard of him. But there's also, finally, to talk about the scientists here, the idea that they were respected in their fields and didn't challenge the status quo too much or step outside the lanes of their own disciplines. Because when they did, that caused such a degree of consternation and anger that they found themselves with a lot of problems. So when, in the first week of 1980, at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Alvarezes announced their belief that the dinosaur extinction had not taken place over millions of years as part of some slow, inexorable process, but suddenly, in a single explosive event, it shouldn't have come as a shock, but it did. It was received everywhere, but particularly in the paleontological world, as an outrageous heresy. Well, you have to remember, as Sorrow recalls, that we were amateurs in this field. Walter was a geologist specializing in paleomagnetism. Louis was a physicist, and I was a nuclear chemist. And now here we were telling paleontologists that we had solved a problem that had eluded them for over a century. It's not terribly surprising that they didn't embrace it immediately. As Louis Alvarez joked, we were caught practicing geology without a license. 
keeping within the discipline of geology, we have another scientist who is coming up with the idea that certain of the Earth's mountain ranges were millions of years older than they might have thought at first and in fact millions of years older than other mountain ranges. For a start, his radical notions questioned the foundations of their discipline, seldom an effective way to generate warmth in an audience. Such a challenge would have been painful enough coming from a geologist, but Wegener had no background in geology. He was a meteorologist, for goodness sake. A weatherman. A German weatherman. These were not remediable deficiencies. And so geologists took every pain they could to dismiss his evidence and belittle his suggestions. Here's some other ideas about specific scientists. Physicists are notoriously scornful of scientists from other fields. When the great Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli's wife left him for a chemist, he was staggered with disbelief. Had she taken a bullfighter, I would have understood, he remarked in wonder to a friend. But a chemist? It was a feeling Rutherford would have understood. All science is either physics or stamp collecting, he once said, in a line that has been used many times since. There is a certain engaging irony, therefore, that his award of the Nobel Prize in 1908 was in chemistry, not physics. You thought physicists were bad, though. Here's a quote from another book called Java Man, which says, And of all the disciplines in science, paleoanthropology boasts perhaps the largest share of egos, say the authors of the recent Java Man, a book it may be noted that itself devotes long, wonderfully unselfconscious passages to attacks on the inadequacies of others, in particular the author's former close colleague Donald Johansson. And of course we have our horny botanist who had declared himself the greatest thing in science. <laughs> So all of that altogether just makes me think how much more we would know about ourselves and our universe if we had allowed others to do science, if it wasn't confined to just this tiny, tiny fraction of the population. I mean, it, and it's really an argument to a society that looks after their own basic needs. I mean, if everybody didn't have to worry about housing, food, education or health care, if all those things were taken care of, just imagine all the minds that would be freed up to think about science and to explore the world and learn more about those around us. I mean, I think that's one big point in favor of a system that uses universal basic income, for instance. I think society would benefit so much from that type of personal freedom to explore the world or create art or just pursue our passions and our interests. Now, would everybody just spend all their time on their phones on social media? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure that would happen a lot, but there still would be those people that normally wouldn't have the opportunities to spend their time and energies with this sort of thing who would, I think, make some amazing discoveries. So let's expand our scope now beyond the individual scientists and the ways in which we limited the exploration that could be done there and look at the other bigger hurdles that the scientists who were able to do science were confronted with and had to overcome. The specific things I'm going to look at are the church or religion, politics, including government and corporations, which are generally tied hand in hand. We have their own eccentric personalities and we have even other scientists getting in their way. So just a quick look at each of those areas that have been big stumbling blocks to scientific advancement. The first one, the church is a pretty obvious thing. I mean, right from the beginning, science has had to come up against the church and religious ideologies. And unfortunately, to this day, that's still a thing, which is kind of crazy. I'll just read one quick quote on this particular topic. Finally, in the 1650s, witchcraft trials came to Bermuda, and Norwood spent his final years in severe unease that his papers on trigonometry, with their arcane symbols, would be taken as communications with the devil, and that he would be treated to a dreadful execution. And <laughs> it's really kind of outrageous that this is the type of thing the scientists would be dealing with. However, Based on my own experience with studying mathematics, I wouldn't be opposed to making trigonometry a capital offense. I mean, I'm just saying. Moving on now to the politics side of things, we have this 
really quite depressing note. Now we're in the 1950s and scientists are working on DNA, the basic molecular shape of DNA and all the interesting stuff that goes along with that. And they were kind of on the verge of making some interesting discoveries. We have two scientists named Watson and Crick and it says they redoubled their efforts. Everything now seemed to go their way. At one point, Pauling was en route to a conference in England at which he would in all likelihood have met Wilkins and learned enough to correct the misconceptions that had put him on the wrong line of inquiry. But this was the McCarthy era and Pauling found himself detained at Idlewood Airport in New York, his passport confiscated on the grounds that he was too liberal of temperament to be allowed to travel abroad. <laughs> Which, I mean, uh, as outrageous as this was in the 1950s, it's just not too big a stretch to think that certain governments wouldn't be opposed to that nowadays, to preventing people from entering the country who were liberal of temperament. Now, I mentioned that politics and corporations kind of go hand in hand, and the book goes into some detail describing a couple of fights with big business that scientists had to go through. One was with the lead industry, and another was with the petroleum industry, both of which obviously scientists were discovering the extremely harmful effects on humanity that certain products and certain chemicals had, and the big money that was up against them in their fight to get this information out there and for governments to actually act on it. And I'm going to leave this topic behind as quickly as possible because for me, I think the most depressing thing in modern science is the politicization of science. The fact that whether you actually believe in something as basically helpful and good for society as vaccination, whether or not you believe that has more to do with your which, which political side you're on than anything else is beyond my comprehension. But yeah, scientists have always been bumping up against politics in their fight to do good things for humanity. Unfortunately, doing good things often meant certain people would make less money. And the people with the most money are the most powerful, so there's the problem. The next obstacle here is the scientists' own personalities that, like I alluded to early on, were, yes, often quirky and funny, but also just really disturbingly out there. I had mentioned the Haldanes, the father and son who came from a very wealthy family, and the younger Haldane, the son here, fought during World War I, and the book says, perhaps uniquely among human beings, the younger Haldane found the First World War, quote, a very enjoyable experience, and freely admitted that he, quote, enjoyed the opportunity of killing people. And then it goes on to describe the horrific experiments that Haldane would actually perform on himself, causing himself pretty severe injuries, but also on his colleagues, even his wife. It said his wife at one point had a 13 minute long seizure because of the horrible things he was subjecting her just to experiment for the sake of science and just the horrible injuries he caused uh, many other people with his experiments and the maybe enjoyment he seemed to get out of it. I think the biggest personality thing, though, that seems to get in the way over and over again with these particular scientists, especially the notable ones, are their own egos. And there's this interesting quote here talking about the difficulties with interpreting data and coming to correct conclusions. Finally, but perhaps above all, human nature is a factor in all this. Scientists have a natural tendency to interpret finds in the way that most flatters their stature. It is a rare paleontologist, indeed, who announces that he has found a cachet of bones, but that they are nothing to get excited about. As John Reeder understatedly observes in the book Missing Links, it is remarkable how often the first interpretations of a new evidence have confirmed the preconceptions of his discoverer. But finally, Again, going back to depressing stuff, is just the amount of infighting and competition and jealousy amongst scientists themselves, both across disciplines and within their own disciplines, amongst their closest colleagues. It's so infuriating to read over and over again just the internal politics that has evolved with science, even going as far as something like the, uh, the awarding of the Nobel Prize, just the pol politics that's involved with something like that. But we just see this over and over again. One really famous example is with dinosaur discoveries. 
Perhaps nothing in natural history has been at the center of fiercer and more enduring hatreds than the line of ancient beasts known as dinosaurs. Specifically, we have the two paleontologists who were at the forefront of making these scientific discoveries, and it was between two strange and ruthless men, Edward Drinker Cope, there's another great name, Drinker is his middle name, and Othniel Charles Marsh. <laughs> Othniel, cool. They had much in common. Both were spoiled, driven, self-centered, quarrelsome, jealous, mistrustful, and ever unhappy. Between them, they changed the world of paleontology. Going back to DNA research now, we have one team in England who was responsible for some really groundbreaking discoveries in the field of DNA stuff, DNA stuff, scientific talk there, who are described as, quote, an unlikely quartet of scientists in England who didn't work as a team, often weren't on speaking terms, and were for the most part novices in the field. And this stuff could get nasty. Another Canadian getting a raw deal here is a scientist named Oswald Avery who made some really important groundbreaking discoveries, again in the world of DNA. And the Austrian-born biochemist Erwin Chargaff later quite seriously suggested that Avery's discovery was worth two Nobel Prizes. Unfortunately, Avery was opposed by one of his own colleagues at the Institute, a strong-willed and disagreeable protein enthusiast named Alfred Mirsky, who did everything in his power to discredit Avery's work, including, it has been said, lobbying the authorities at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm not to give Avery a Nobel Prize. Avery by this time was 66 years old and tired. Unable to deal with the stress and controversy, he resigned his position and never went near a lab again. So just the level of pettiness and, and just sheer meanness amongst these very intelligent men. Just wild. And really sadly, it all leads to this one statement by a scientist who's, I guess, Discoveries were somewhat debunked, and anyways, the scientist says, it was pretty stunning, recalls Anderson. I mean, we had this thing that was really important, and then suddenly we didn't have it anymore. But even worse was the realization that the people we thought we'd been collaborating with hadn't bothered to share with us their new findings. Somebody else asks, why not? He shrugged, who knows? Anyway, here's the depressing statement. It was a pretty good insight into how unattractive science can get when you're playing at a certain level. And it didn't stop with just putting up roadblocks for colleagues or, or preventing them from sharing ideas or trying to discredit them. It just, it so often went to outright stealing their discoveries and taking the credit for them. Another kind of sad quote at the end of this one here. Another scientist who had come up with a, an amazing discovery regarding the Ice Age stuff. There's stuff again. Yeah, I gotta find a better word than that. It was a radical notion. He lent Agassiz his notes, then came very much to regret it, as Agassiz increasingly got the credit for what Schimper felt, with some legitimacy, was his theory. Charpentier, likewise, ended up a bitter enemy of his old friend. Alexander von Humboldt, yet another friend, may have had Agassiz at least partly in mind when he observed that there are three stages in scientific discovery. First, people deny that it is true. Then, they deny that it is important. Finally, they credit the wrong person. So again, I'm left with all the more feeling just how much more we would know about the universe and ourselves if the scientists across disciplines worked cooperatively and open-mindedly with each other and weren't filled with such ego and glory chasing. Thankfully, this has not always been the case. I mean, an English Quaker named John Dalton, who became a well-known scientist, stood out as being different in this manner. Although Dalton tried to avoid all honors, he was elected to the Royal Society against his wishes, showered with medals, and given a handsome government pension. When he died in 1844, 40,000 people viewed the coffin and the funeral cortege stretched for two miles. His entry in the Dictionary of National Biography is one of the longest rivaled in length among 19th century men of science only by those of Darwin and Lyell. So there's a humble man who wasn't in it for the spotlight, yet did great work. So before we wrap up, let's move into some rapid fire fun facts that I pulled out of this book. The first couple were what I would say were kind of scientific oopses. 
After a long time, it was assumed that anything so miraculously energetic as radioactivity must be beneficial. For years, manufacturers of toothpaste and laxatives put radioactive thorium in their products, and at least until the late 1920s, the Glen Springs Hotel in the Finger Lakes region of New York, and doubtless others as well, featured with pride the therapeutic effects of its radioactive mineral springs. It wasn't banned in consumer products until 1938. We'll jump forward a few decades to the 60s. With the structure of DNA understood, progress in genetics was swift. And by 1968, the journal Science could run an article entitled, That Was the Molecular Biology That Was, suggesting, it hardly seems possible, but it is so, that the work of genetics was nearly at an end. <laughs> and there have been a couple of times in history where they've said, well, we've discovered all there is to know about physics, or whatever it may be. But continuing along with some fun facts, rapid fire style. In 1781, Herschel became the first person in the modern era to discover a planet. He wanted to call it George after the British monarch, but was overruled. Instead, it became Uranus. And, I mean, pretty much all monarchs are assholes, so Uranus, George, not that different. It is still a fairly astounding notion to consider that atoms are mostly empty space, and that the solidity we experience all around us is an illusion. When two objects come together in the real world, billiard balls are most often used for illustration, they don't actually strike each other. Rather, as Timothy Ferris explains, the negatively charged fields of the two balls repel each other. Were it not for their electrical charges, they could, like galaxies, pass right through each other unscathed. When you sit in a chair, you are not actually sitting there, but levitating above it at a height of one angstrom, a hundred millionth of a centimeter. Your electrons and its electrons implacably opposed to any closer intimacy. Next, about atoms. They are also fantastically durable. Because they are so long-lived, atoms really get around. Every atom you possess has almost certainly passed through several stars and been part of millions of organisms on its way to becoming you. We are each so atomically numerous and so vigorously recycled at death that a significant number of our atoms, up to a billion for each of us it has been suggested, probably once belonged to Shakespeare. A billion more each came from Buddha and Genghis Khan and Beethoven and any other historical figure you care to name. Although it also adds, the personages have to be historical, apparently, as it takes the atoms some decades to become thoroughly redistributed. However much you may wish it, you are not yet one with Elvis Presley. The weird properties of elements. The properties of the elements can become more curious still when they are combined. Oxygen and hydrogen, for instance, are two of the most combustion-friendly elements around, but put them together and they make incombustible water. Otter still, in combination, are sodium, one of the most unstable of all elements, and chlorine, one of the most toxic. Drop a small lump of pure sodium into ordinary water and it will explode with enough force to kill. Chlorine is even more notoriously hazardous. Though useful in small concentrations for killing microorganisms, as chlorine you smell in bleach, in larger volumes it is lethal. Chlorine was the element of choice for many of the poison gases of the First World War. And, as many a sore-eyed swimmer will attest, even an exceedingly dilute form the human body doesn't appreciate it. Yet, put these two nasty elements together and what do you get? Sodium chloride. Common table salt. Blue whales. We don't know much about them. What little we know of them comes almost entirely from eavesdropping on their songs. But even these are a mystery. Blue whales will sometimes break off a song, then pick it up again at exactly the same spot six months later. Sometimes they strike up with a new song, which no member can have heard before, but which each already knows. How they do this, and why, are not remotely understood. And these are animals that must routinely come to the surface to breathe. Beautiful blue whale song. And who would have thought that one of the most fascinating things I would read about in this book are slime molds? Talking about just how difficult it is to classify all of life, even less comfortably susceptible to categorization was the peculiar group of organisms formerly called myxomycetes, but more commonly known as slime molds. The name, no doubt, has much to do with their obscurity. An appellation that sounded a little more dynamic, ambulant self-activating protoplasm, say, and less like the stuff you find when you reach deep into a clogged drain, would almost certainly have earned these extraordinary entities a more immediate share of the attention they deserve. For slime molds are, make no mistake, among the most interesting 
interesting organisms in nature. When times are good, they exist as one-celled individuals, much like amoebas. But when conditions grow tough, they crawl to a central gathering place and become, almost miraculously, a slug. The slug is not a thing of beauty, and it doesn't go terribly far, usually just from the bottom of a pile of leaf litter to the top, where it is in a slightly more exposed position. But for millions of years, this may well have been the niftiest trick in the universe. And it doesn't stop there. Having hauled itself up to a more favorable locale, the slime mold transforms itself yet again, taking on the form of a plant. By some curious orderly process, the cells reconfigure, like the members of a tiny marching band, to make a stalk atop of which forms a bulb known as a fruiting body. Inside the fruiting body are millions of spores, which, at the appropriate moment, are released to the wind to blow away to become single-celled organisms that can start the process again. What? <laughs> what, is, what is even going on there? Next up it are the cells within our body. Just a myriad of different types of cells in different organs and different parts of the body and how they all communicate with each other and work together. What is perhaps most remarkable is that it is all just random frantic action. A sequence of endless encounters directed by nothing more than elemental rules of attraction and repulsion. There's clearly no thinking presence behind any of the actions of the cells. It all just happens smoothly and repeatedly and so reliably that seldom are we even conscious of it. Yet somehow, all this produces not just order within the cell, but a perfect harmony right across the organism. In ways that we have barely begun to understand, trillions upon trillions of reflexive chemical reactions add up to a mobile, thinking, decision-making you. Or, come to that, a rather less reflective but still incredibly organized dung beetle. Every living thing, never forget, is a wonder of atomic engineering. Staying on the subject of cells, your skin cells are all dead. It's a somewhat galling notion to reflect that every inch of your surface is deceased. If you are an average sized adult, you are lugging around over two kilograms of dead skin, of which several billion tiny fragments are sloughed off each day. Run a finger along a dusty shelf, and you are drawing a pattern very largely in old skin. Most living cells seldom last more than a month or so, but there are some notable exceptions. Liver cells can survive for years, though the components within them may be renewed every few days. Brain cells last as long as you do. You are issued with a hundred billion or so at birth and that is all you are ever going to get. It has been estimated that you lose 500 of them in an hour. So if you have any serious thinking to do, there really isn't a moment to waste. The good news is that the individual components of your brain cells are constantly renewed so that, as with the liver cells, no part of them is actually likely to be more than about a month old. Indeed, it has been suggested that there isn't a single bit of any of us, not so much as a stray molecule, that was part of us nine years ago. It may not feel like it, but at the cellular level, we are all youngsters. <laughs> and that goes back to that whole thought experiment of if you have a boat, and you slowly replace the wood in the boat over time so that eventually the entire boat has been replaced. Is it still the same boat? Well, we're still the same person even though our entire body apparently gets renewed at least every nine years. <laughs> now this does move on to slightly disgusting facts. If your pillow is six years old, which is apparently about the average age for a pillow, it has been estimated that one-tenth of its weight will be made up of sloughed skin, living mites, dead mites, and mite dung. By way of comfort, the author adds, but at least they are your mites. Think of what you snuggle up with each time you climb into a hotel bed. Uh -huh. But no use in worrying about mites when there are volcanoes to worry about. In 1815, on the island of Sumbawa in Indonesia, a handsome and long quiescent mountain named Tambora exploded spectacularly, killing a hundred thousand people with its blast and associated tsunamis. No one living now has ever seen such fury. Tambora was far bigger than anything any living human has experienced. It was the biggest volcanic explosion in 10,000 years, 150 times the size of Mount St. Helens, equivalent to 60 60,000 Hiroshima-sized atom bombs. 1815, that wasn't that long ago, and the destruction it wrought was incredible. Spring never came, and summer never warmed. 1816 became known as the year without summer. Crops everywhere failed to grow. In Ireland, a famine and associated typhoid epidemic killed 65,000 people. In New England, the year became popularly known as 1800 and froze to death. And we'll stay on the topic of volcanoes for our last cheery fact. Thanks to everything that was happening 
beneath and within Yellowstone, geologists realized that only one thing could cause this, a restless magma chamber. Yellowstone wasn't the site of an ancient supervolcano, it was the site of an active one. It was also at about this time that they were able to work out that the cycle of Yellowstone's eruptions averaged one massive blow every 600,000 years. The last one was 630,000 years ago. Yellowstone, it appears, is due. Best not think about that one. And now I'll conclude with a few just fun quotes about humanity and our place within the universe. We'll start with another cheerful little message here. It's an unnerving thought that we may be the living universe's supreme achievement and its worst nightmare simultaneously. And that's of course because of humanity's amazingly brilliant uh, ability to discover and learn things and their amazingly terrible way of being able to cause species after species to go into extinction, such as the dodos, which this paragraph is discussing here when it says, human beings, a species of organism that is capable of unraveling the deepest secrets of the heavens while at the same time pounding into extinction for no purpose at all, a creature that never did us any harm and wasn't even remotely capable of understanding what we were doing to it as we did it. But another interesting view on humans is this fascinating thought. A physicist is the atom's way of thinking about atoms. Sort of going back to the idea that the cells, the atoms, all the individual components of our body act in such a perfect manner without us instructing them to do so. But despite everything we've learned up till now, and like I said, so much interesting stuff has been happening in, in recent history, which just makes me excited to see what's gonna happen over the next decade or two. The upshot of all this is that we live in a universe whose age we can't quite compute, surrounded by stars whose distances from us and each other we don't altogether know, filled with matter we can't identify, operating in conformance with physical laws whose properties we don't truly understand. And, you know, things just as basic as time or gravity are things we still haven't really fully understood. And that is why we need as many people as possible in, in an as inclusive and open-minded manner as possible working on science. Even though when it comes right down to it, what is the purpose of life? And here at its most basic is what the purpose of life is. Quote, it does really seem that the purpose of life is to perpetuate DNA. <laughs> I mean, that's about as basic as it gets, but probably as true as it gets, in, in my opinion. Some people might find that way of thinking depressing, and so they need maybe more to meaning in life. I think it's fine. <laughs> it is what it is. But let's end on one final uplifting note. Again, going back to the idea that all life came from one single source. Every living thing is an elaboration on a single original plan. As humans, we are mere increments, each of us a musty archive of adjustments, adaptations, modifications, and providential tinkerings stretching back 3.8 billion years. Remarkably, we are even quite closely related to fruit and vegetables. About half the chemical functions that take place in a banana are fundamentally the same as the chemical functions that take place in you. It cannot be said too often. All life is one. That is, and I suspect will forever prove to be, the most profound true statement there is. And for my money, I think that some of the most fascinating discoveries that are being made and will continue to be made are just how interconnected all life truly is. I mean, we look at forests and the fungal networks between them, and we learn that a forest is almost like one giant organism all communicating with itself and relying on all of the various elements within it. And I think that can be spread out to larger ecosystems, just how all the life in its various forms functions within an ecosystem and helps to create harmony and balance within the ecosystem. And who knows how far we can spread that out to an entire planet, to a universe. and. There really is, I think, a sense that all life is interconnected in a way and is held in a delicate balance that we humans have proven can be easily broken. So hopefully that can be a, an encouragement to us to continue to learn about life and our world and our universe and how best we can live as intelligent life forms within the ecosystems we find ourselves in. So after all that, what do I rate the book? I find it 
so hard to rate nonfiction books. I mean, what makes this history slash science book any better or worse than somebody's autobiography or a how to paint book or whatever it may be and ultimately I think I just have to approach it in the same way as I approach a fiction book and strictly base my rating on how much I enjoyed reading the book. And so based on that, I'm going to give A Short History of Nearly Everything an 8.5 out of 10. I really enjoyed the reading experience. I learned a lot of interesting things, most of which has gone in one ear and out the other. And like many complicated scientific ideas, I'm not sure how much I've really held on to, but it was certainly very fun to read about. And I'm really happy that Joanna recommended I pick up and read this book. So that is that. What have you been reading lately? I would love to hear what books have been capturing your interest. Are there any books on science in particular that you have found to be very interesting? Are there any upcoming releases that you're excited to get to? I would really love to hear about it if you want to get into the comments and let me know. And if you think the work I put into this video it has earned me a thumb up, go ahead and take a second to do that. In any case, I really appreciate you being here, and I'll be back soon to talk about some more fiction. Cheers. Oh, one concern, <coughs> a lot of it too, has, and I'm going to look at each of those, and I'm going to briefly look at each of those things that I just, in the book mentions, in the book mentions, and the book mentions that, and now he, he, and for people to, for horrific experience, and really sadly, we had this one, and very sadly, this all leads to this one person. Oh God, I got the page number. Paragraph. Is this fascinating? I thought. Felt that coming. Uh. <coughs> <Ooh>. uh. 